what's the Kotlin multi-platform pitch? Why does it matter if you're an engineering manager? You've probably seen it compared to React Native and Flutter. Just give us the pitch on Kotlin multi-platform and why engineering managers should be looking at it. Why you should look at it is, uh, it's interesting because we get caught up in all these discussions about various technologies and like forget to restate the basic problem. And the basic problem is um, there's a lot of duplicate work happening. So, uh, you know, I've said this for a while. I, I open up talks with, you know, we have this cognitive dissonance, which is programming is fundamentally the reduction of repetitive work. And we're also continually and, and continuing to do so, repeating a ton of work. So obviously, reduction of work is essentially the primary goal of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and to some degree, more efficient work. And that, that's why there's you know, been this ongoing language improvement, you know, Kotlin, Swift, uh, Rust, and, and whatever. There are reasons why these languages have changes. You know, there are reasons why languages progress. So, um, the fundamental reason why we like Kotlin multi-platform is that it is a an optional natively integrated shared code solution. So you can implement certain features and expose them as a library to the other platforms that are consuming your code. Things like React Native, things like Xamarin, things like Flutter, um, they're all their own environment, their own third environment that treat a native integration as a very hands-off quarantined thing that is ultimately pretty difficult to do, especially in the case of a Flutter where none of the UI components are native. So integrating with the native platform itself is, while possible, going to be a very difficult proposition in practice. So we're not super excited about shared UI. Um, in the cases where shared UI is very difficult to integrate with a native UI. Now, as we move forward with the Kotlin multi-platform, I have this discussion a lot. You know, people are like, oh, okay, so there's no UI. I'm like, well, there's no UI library now. The whole point of the way that this works is it's optionally sharing code. So um, there are going to be shared UI libraries that emerge, probably from the community in the near term. And they're gonna be of the form where you can share some of your UI uh, some of it's going to be native, but it's easy to integrate with the native, as opposed to many of these other tools, which involve very big decisions and I would say risk. And that's ultimately the the part of this discussion that when it's it's sort of a developer-driven discussion, um, I found that risk tends to not be something that is super, uh, super deeply considered. And I'm not talking just technical risk. I'm talking institutional and you know, long-term risk about betting on a platform. And as you get into talking to larger teams and orgs, they're far more concerned about that. Because if you decide, if you're an individual developer who decides to learn Flutter, that's fine. Next year, if you decide to learn something else, that's you know, whatever that time sunk into that was. If you're an organization that decides you're gonna start re-releasing everything in Flutter, there's a lot of rehiring and retraining, uh, rewriting, and that has to happen, and if it's a few years from now and that was a bad decision, uh, it's a much higher cost. What are the biggest challenges Swift iOS developers can expect with working with Kotlin multi-platform? I think today um, the most obvious challenge is just going to be that the platform itself is new. So um, there's not a lot of documentation, there's not a lot of clear examples that are, that are up to date with the latest stuff, and that's that's something that you'd expect with anything, any kind of new platform. And there's not much to do with that other than to be prepared for um, having to dig a little further to, to find the information you need. It's just part for the course. Um, going a little further, uh, Kotlin and Swift have, have some similarities, but they're fundamentally different languages. So, um, and they currently interop through Objective-C. So it, it's, they're con um, it's conceptually similar to talking to Objective-C libraries from Swift. Uh, but that means you're going to lose some some meaning along the way as far as uh, value types and things like that. So it's it's understanding what is going to work well and what's not as far as that that interop layer and and setting expectations accordingly. And what are we doing right now to help overcome some of those challenges? 
Um, so we we're we're doing a few things. We're publishing an Xcode plugin for Kotlin, um, which is uh, you know for an iOS developer, their their primary tool set is almost certainly going to be Xcode, and for any developer, they really need to have. Um, access to the runtime of, of the language they're working on. They need to be able to see what it's doing. So um, we feel like that's going to really um, be a, a quick and, and really straightforward win for that. We're also, um, in a broader sense, working on improving the interop between Swift and Kotlin. And as a concrete step in that, we are currently pushing a, a version of generic support for uh, from Kotlin generics to Objective C and ultimately Swift generics, which should help with um, type readability, type safety, uh, things like that. How would you, what advice would you give them to get their iOS developers started on this journey? Well, um, I think we have to get everyone bought into the idea that this is something that we want to pursue and that. I think most developers, if you really get down to it, also don't like the idea that a lot of this, um, a lot of duplicate work is happening. It's just, it just seems wrong. Uh, and especially as someone who, you know, going back a few years, uh, what we did was basically Android only work. Uh, we wound up in the position often of being the second platform. So, you're you're really duplicating a lot of logic, which becomes, you know, not only something that as a developer is is not the most interesting. You're also um, you introducing unique problems such as uh, keeping up with features as time goes on. Um, you know, avoiding introducing your own bugs by copying logic. Uh, how do you track bug fixes that happen upstream and get them downstream? Yada yada yada. There's all kinds of problems that. Um, feel like they don't need to be solved. So getting um, the team just bought into the idea that this is something that they want to pursue, as opposed to something that they're gonna actively resist, is important. That is really step number one. Uh, step number two, specifically to the iOS world, um, Swift is a great language, and Swift has a lot of modern language features that uh, Kotlin has, has basically similar equivalents, but they're not 100% the same. But it's really communicating the idea that they're both languages that are at the bleeding edge of solving these same kind of problems in, in roughly equivalent ways. Essentially selling Kotlin to Swift developers is, is kind of step number two. Um, one of the, the big issues that we've had in going into this is how to treat that politically such that um, not making it feel as though we're going to be, you know, n not making this a, a criticism of Swift per se, but this is going to be better for everybody if we get this to work, right? And then from there, starting with the pieces that are traditionally difficult and also um, somewhat easily isolated in anybody's architecture. And this is when we go into the obvious one of, you know, persistence and especially with SQLite. Um, for all of the things that you could argue that are better on either platform, I haven't found a lot of developers who would argue that core data is better than what's happening on Android as far as SQLite is concerned. So um, it is generally one of those places because you can optionally start sharing code. It's one of those places where it's relatively easy to convince people that it's a good idea to homogenize their implementations. And from there, it's a kind of a negotiation to see how it goes. Let's go back to the Xcode um, Kotlin debugger. Mm -hmm. Describe it for me. What does it do? What issues does it solve? Is it ready right now? So it's a debugger. Um, if you're a software developer, I think that's uh, it's pretty straightforward. Essentially, you can see um, it's a debugger and actually a source formatter. So you can see Kotlin with source coloring. Um, Xcode will recognize Kotlin files as source files. You can attach breakpoints. And then um, as you're running code in the simulator, the if you hit a breakpoint, you can see the, the values that are there. You can run uh, statements and, and do all the normal stuff you would do with the debugger. Um, we are 
that's ready to, to go out now. It's definitely, um, there's definitely things that we're going to be adding over time. And most of this has to do with um, two, two major things, getting more source into the into Xcode automatically. So being able to pull dependencies so you can step into your dependencies and libraries and see what that's what they're doing. But also um, just better support for the debugger formatting itself. Um, and that's a much longer discussion about LLDB. But um, yeah, you should be able to use it now. And, and we're taking feedback from teams that are using it in the field. Let's talk about um, Kotlin multi-platform and Swift generics. It seems like it's a big topic. There's a lot of elements of how developers are able to use Swift to express certain things uh, on the iOS platform. Walk us through the advancements you're making with Kotlin multi-platform and generics. So um, it's it gets a little into the weeds as far as details. Uh, Kotlin and Swift and Objective-C all support generics, uh, but they support different features and in different ways, right? So um, the, there are like logical and formal reasons, formal language reasons why JetBrains didn't include Objective-C um, generics output from Kotlin. Um, and, you know, I, I understand their arguments for not doing that. But it also forces, on the Swift side, a lot of manual casting and a lot of, I guess, uh, relatively ugly code stuff to step around that. And there's also a lack of discoverability for types when you're using Swift uh, from Xcode, right? So our unofficial official role in this world right now is to be sort of the iOS developer advocate trying to... Um, bridge the gap and make things more palatable to an iOS team. And this is definitely one of those things that um, we feel in talking to a bunch of teams that having partial support is better than not having any support, um, regardless of formalities and, and reasons why. So, um, you know, exactly how that works, uh, exactly what that should look like. There's a bunch of trade-offs that have to be made and decisions. Uh, that's a different discussion, and we're trying to initiate the discussion. So we're pushing up um, a version of Kotlin Native back to the JetBrains team and saying, hey, let's let's open up this discussion. Here's our implementation. What do you think? And then also really, um, I think, highlighting how much interest there is out in the field for this, which is uh, something that, you know, JetBrains is busy. They have a lot of conflicting priorities, and... Um, they don't, you know, they have to make a lot of decisions real fast. So we have to, we're, our role is to kind of step back and say, like, hey, well, we really think we should revisit this one. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. Um, if you were to have an ideal situation where an engineering manager has a team, right? You think about the composition of the team. What is the ideal scenario for someone to get started with Kotlin multi-platform? I think today... Um, it would be disingenuous to say that this isn't somewhat what, what of an Android forward solution. Um, so having Android experience developers who uh, have also some, potentially some experience delivering for iOS uh, and the web would be probably your ideal starting point. But the reality of the world is that most of these teams are, are kind of split down the middle. And we are attempting to make this less of an Android forward or an Android exclusive uh, solution to this problem, right? Um, not just because th that's gonna be better for the technical implementation, but uh, obviously a lot of political considerations within teams to do that. I would say today, uh, Regardless of you know which flavor of, of mobile engineer, if you're going to deliver mobile, having native mobile development experience is going to help uh, considerably, and um, probably more of an Android leaning team members. But ultimately, the goal is to have uh, people buy into the idea of being mobile developers. So um, that's that. But regardless, uh, you know it, it's not. It's not as much of an Android forward thing as you might think, because the really difficult parts 
that happen when you get to native or understanding how um, iOS and native sides actually build, how LLVM gets linked into Swift code, how all these things work together. Understanding what a linker error looks like in Xcode is something that an Android developer has never seen and is going to have to learn. So um, it's it's like it's surface level Android forward, but it's not as much as you'd think, I guess. Mm -hmm. So 